Matthew Allen, thank you for your invitation. Kristen Garcia, Kristen Garcia, and I go way back to the Clinton administration. <laughs> So uh, basically, Occupat is um, a, a, a project that started in March of this year. And it happened to coincide with the Thunder um, launch pad. I'm sure you're familiar with the accelerator program um, that is between um, Oklahoma City Thunder and Stitch Crew in Oklahoma City. Um, basically, you know, they um, advertise uh, looking for startups at any stage who are specifically focused on financial tech and ag tech, and one of the, one of the categories was ed tech. So I pitched this idea, and I'm very fortunate and blessed to have been chosen to be a part of that. Um, so that launch pad started in March, and so did the pocket pad. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about us before I tell you a story that's really going to put things into perspective. So, um, born and raised in Oklahoma City, I graduated from OU uh, in 2002. I uh, went on to do a master's at Columbia University in New York City, which is how I did an internship at Sesame Street. It's filmed in New York City. Um, and I did it in communication and education, and I'm currently a doctoral student also through Columbia, uh, specifically in human cognition and the human development department, basically how people learn. So through our through the doctoral program, um, we've done a lot of projects that involve technology and education, a lot of ed tech projects that I've worked on, and a lot of other people's dissertations, right? So now, I'm at the point. I'm at the point to where I'm, I'm now working on my dissertation, and I know that my dissertation is going to be about virtual reality and, and its role in education. So this is somewhat related to to my studies, to my research, um, and basically uh, what all kind of happened is so I'm an educator by background. I have experience um, teaching in the classroom, and most recently uh, I spent three years at Oklahoma City Community College, working as a career counselor for a program called Upward Bound, working with high school students helping them to make choices about uh, college and careers in general and majors and whatnot. So a lot of high school students would come into my office and they would ask for job shadow opportunities um, or, we, or we would do career assessment quizzes. Um, there was once a young man who was now studying physical therapy at OU and he was in my office while I joined the Southeast High School in Oklahoma City and he uh, had this idea that he, want, he knew that he wanted to work somehow in the medical field, work with people, not sure how. We did the career assessment quiz, I'm sure many of you have done, have done at some point or seen, you know, answer questions about what type of job you like. It spits out some suggestions, and it's up to you go, to go and research those suggestions, right? So he saw on his list for ONET, which is from the Department of Labor, U.S. Department of Labor, he saw that he was a good match for occupational therapy and physical therapy. So he says, hey Greg, what's the difference between occupational and physical therapy? So that's a good question, so let's look it up. And uh, so ultimately, after we've done some research, he decided that physical therapy maybe could be uh, what he would prefer as opposed to occupational therapy. And the, the, we then came to the point where we needed to do a job shadowing experience. So he went and job shadowed physical therapist and fell in love, right? But then, so that's, so that's kind of a success story, right? Then, I, then this past December, a young lady comes into my office and says, Greg, I want a job shadowing opportunity as well. Sure, what are you interested in? I want to be a marine biologist. And I thought to myself, wow, it was hard enough to find a physical therapist for Luis to shadow. How am I going to find a marine biologist for you to shadow? So, uh, yeah, in Oklahoma, being landlocked, it was very tough to find someone. And that's what led to this idea of Occupy. This idea that if you can't be there in person, the next best thing is to be there virtually. So I looked to see if anybody was offering that, uh, capitalizing on virtual reality or augmented reality to to give you more information about your potential next career step, careers out there that you might be interested in. Because if you think about it, job shadowing in its, in its natural sense is really probably as old as, as a human, human speech, this idea that I see what you're doing, I'd like to learn more about what you do, can you teach me how you do it? And it really hasn't been updated much since then. Um, you know, we've obviously got streaming videos out there, but I want to take it a step further with virtual reality. So and it kind of coincides with a national problem that's happening all across the United States. This idea, of course, that you've seen people, uh, you know, I'm sure maybe you're in this situation at some point where you say, you know, I, I want to do something I'm passionate about, but I'm not sure what. I, in other words, I don't know what I want to be in my growth. Or I'm an undecided major. If only I could figure out more about it. So we're marrying the two, the problem and the solution, and which the problem at the individual level, career uncertainty, 
is something that then links out to our state economies, this idea that uh, we have a lot of jobs unfulfilled, especially in the STEM fields. So we want to bring together virtual reality, creating these virtual experiences to put yourself in virtually in the shoes of the professional to learn more about what it is they do and, and day in and day out. So ultimately it would be a software um, approach to where uh, you, would, you would do that career assessment and then instead of just giving you suggestions that you yourself are supposed to go research on your own, a text-based list of suggestions, it gives you a visual list of results that you can then watch and view and to see if it's a good fit for you. And in essence, a good step. Where we are right now is, there's also an interesting training element that comes into this, so there's the career ed piece, it's sort of the long-term, bigger part of our mission, uh, but then on the side, it's interesting when you, when you talk about workforce, there's also this idea that um, VR can be used for training, it's something that I really didn't expect to delve into, but it's something we're doing now, so we're currently working with Hunter to do a uh, sales training experience, placing uh, trainees in the office of a potential client, teaching them how to use uh, visual cues in the office and pick up nonverbal cues to, uh, to help drive the sale motors to help build rapport with a potential client. With Francis Tuttle, we're using virtual reality for uh, recruiting purposes and also to a, to a smaller extent what you can do with this degree. Um, we are currently in seed stage funding. Um, just want to buy some equipment. I uh, want to bring on developers. As you heard me say, I'm an educator, so I, I don't have much experience uh, as I, I would like to add up in terms of um, programming. Um, an animator would be great if you happen to know a 3D animator. Um, here's my contact info. I mean, I'll also have to be around afterwards to give you my, to give you my business card. Um, and then last but not least, I do have questions for the community uh, that I'm um, hoping you can help me with. As I mentioned, looking for developers. Uh, so Unity is a game engine. Uh, it's a software that um, you can use to create video games, sort of, sort of like the Unreal game engine, um, because there's an interesting dynamic that happens with VR. I guess I could take that economy, because you, you can have VR, video-based VR, uh, where you know it's a video recording of a 3D environment, or the video game version of that environment, the CGI version. And they both have their pros and cons. And we are kind of focusing on creating a hybrid of, of the two, uh, so you kind of get the best of both worlds in that experience. Um, also. Looking for organizations to create content for, maybe training for your company or a company you know. And then um, <clears throat> I'm interested in kind of figuring out what the community thinks about how much it should cost for, let's say, a 10 minute um, training experience for um, an entry level position at your organization, um, things like that. Um, kind of gives, since we're so new with which one we want, I feel that out. But I very much appreciate all your time and all your questions and your feedback. Yes, so right now in the VR world, and if you kind of see that that's kind of the sweet spot, of course that might change over time. I mean, when you take into account um, having a headset on and being in this whole new world, and that's cut off to the outside world around you. When it comes to VR, 10 minutes seems to be the sweet spot right now in the industry. Um, but you know, like I said, that, that might change. Like there's something uh, that recently came out for me, like the, the top creators of VR content, um, they're called uh, Paul and Felix Studios. Um, they've been doing it for a while, they've done a lot of work for big clients, so they're, to me, they're at the tip-top. Steven Spielberg of Cinematic VR. And they just created a 40-minute video that has been getting a claim. Uh, you know, a lot of critics have this very critically claimed, and a lot of people like a lot of good buzz generating behind it, and so it's having it set on for 40 minutes, and it's, it's, a, it's a fiction narrative. Basically, in a nutshell, it's you are the toy robot that has been opened for Christmas Day, and you see this the Christmas Day, the, the family dynamic, and they're playing with you, the toy robot. And uh, so it's, it's interesting to see how, how that's going to develop. Because ultimately, I would like longer experiences. You know, you can do more stuff with it. But right now, it's this idea that 10 minute chunks, right? So if I'm shadowing, let's say I'm shadowing a neurologist, um, maybe three different experiences, 10 minute experiences of their day to help give you a better sense of what, what, what that job is like. Not for it to be the end all silver bullet, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life but to pique your interest, to give you something that you normally wouldn't have access to. So one of the powerful things about VR that I can mention quickly is that 
VR makes it possible for students from low-income communities, or students with disabilities, or students from rural areas in the United States and in other countries, to be able to shadow someone because those experiences don't always get to happen for people who grew up in those situations. Yes, sir. So, uh, who pays for your services? So right now, this we have, our approach is to use the industry um, to help create content that will then go into the library and ultimately long term we'll have a library of career experiences that will be made available to universities, maybe private high schools, uh, maybe after school programs, um, sort of like the Netflix model, paying to, for access to the content. Um, also, we're approaching grants, we're, we're trying to acquire grants, so in September I'll find out about two grants that I've applied for. One is called the Strata Philanthropy Grant, and basically they're a former student loan uh, company that has now created a foundation uh, to help students actually finish their degree. So they're interested in how um, technology can help with that, with the career path. Um, also, I applied for an SBIR grant um, to work with the Navy, it's the Department of Defense the SBIR grant. They're looking for innovative ways to train their new sailors on ocean, on learning oceanography, the, the physics of the ocean, for anti-submarine warfare. So we've proposed using VR and augmented reality to help train those new sailors on this content. Because right now what they use, surprisingly enough, is they use PowerPoint just to train new sailors about the physics of the ocean so that they can be ready for anti-submarine warfare. So, uh, so to answer your question, the private industry and grants is what we're doing now. And obviously, I um, would love to, at some point, talk to qualified investors to see if they should invest in it. So, this long. You mentioned um, uh, a low income and rural and uh, disabled uh, in your previous answer. And there are agencies that serve those groups that might be willing to, to um, be a client of yours to help pay for some of these services. That's perfect. Yeah, you're right. That's, that's a very good suggestion. I would, I would love to do something like that for sure. And we've always kind of had this idea that K-12 public schools probably wouldn't be able to afford creating content or acting and accessing the content. You're not going to leave you the subscription. So it's this idea that we kind of we're somewhat of a social enterprise, right? That this idea that we're making money, maybe helping um, in, uh, a business internally with uh, reducing training costs and making their training more effective and more rapid. At the same time, we have this uh, other arm that makes this content more easily available to those who don't get it. Um, yes? Um, the bottom question is how much should I charge clients, but how much, I don't have any concept of what, a, what an industry standard would be, first of all. And then so, the second part of my question is I have a small business that, man, it would be super cool if I could have a virtual reality training video for Doggy Dacre, can you imagine how fun that would be? Maybe I sell that just as a video video, you know, a game. But um, is that going to be in my price point? Well, you know, it's, I, I think so because, um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm an educator, right? That's, that's my background. And so, so you, so it's, it's, I think it needs to say that um, I have this mentality, this idea that, you know, we've got to help other people, right? This altruistic, I guess, side to me. Um, which you know may not necessarily translate well to uh, to bid making and making money, right? But what I'm trying to say in that shell is, is I'm, I'm sure we can find a way, right? Um, and it brings up a, another point that I wanted to. Well, you, you talk about how much this charge. So I wanted to tell a story. University of Wisconsin. Uh, one of my lab mates ended up being a professor. Uh, he's already graduated. Ended up being a professor at the University of Wisconsin Madison. Very well known for ed research. And. Um, he is in cahoots with another department there that is using VR for educational purposes. They created an eight-minute VR experience about astrophysics and about Albert Einstein for some museum in Madison, and they charged seventy thousand to do that, which I was very surprised by. Right? That, that I didn't think it would cost that much, uh, but that someone would charge that much. Because on, on our end, it doesn't really cost a lot, especially if it's video based. Right? It's not much. Not much more expensive than creating a 30 second video now than you're going to post on YouTube, right? When it comes to video VR, right? But when it comes to the Unity based the video game VR, of course, in 3D and 360 degrees, and you got your full degrees of freedom. In other words, you can, you're, you're in an experience and you can look behind this podium here, or this column, and you know you feel like you're, you feel like you're more there. In the video, you can't have that, that those degrees of freedom, not yet at least. It's, 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 on, it's on its way. But yeah, that's much more expensive to do a 3D version. But to do a video version, which can be effective as well, it's a lot more accessible. Yes? So states other than Oklahoma, 
home that tend to have regionalized service centers for education, and I think those could be your customer because they bring people together and they have also a requirement to support the um, individual education plans and things like that for students with disabilities. Oh, excellent. And I'd be happy to talk to you about some of those. Yes, because I'm not familiar with that. Uh, I don't know, since I'm here, since I'm born and here, I don't know quite what all that is, right? I just know the Oklahoma system for the most part. A little bit of the New public school system, but not much. Yes. Good side yeah, You mentioned uh, getting this stuff out to rural and uh, lower income folks and things like that. Uh -huh. um, have you thought about like uh, a platform that those guys have access to, which is PlayStation or Xbox, and maybe getting some of your equipment on those platforms, Netflix even? Most people have that stuff no matter where they live, so that yeah. could be something you could. Very good. I haven't, I haven't thought about that. And mainly it's just been this idea of if you don't have headsets, we can rent you headsets, provide you headsets, right. sell you headsets. Um, but yeah, I mean, I probably already have that. Yeah, too. especially if it's PlayStation, yeah. um, HTC Vive, well, more so PlayStation, right? And, and now with Oculus Go, which is the headsets that we've been focusing on lately, they've been out here for two to three months, the Oculus Go. Uh, it's only $200, and it's a self contained. Wireless yeah. uh, has its own, you know, access to the well, Wi-Fi. It's Wi-Fi accessible, so so that makes it easier. Just so maybe at some point more people will have that kind of headset. As well. And then everybody has cell phones, right? And you know, you've seen those yeah. headsets. That's kind of the lower end, but still uh, bigger penetration. There was something behind you that had a question. Um, I wanted to make sure I got heard. Thank you for that suggestion. So I work at Bridges. We help uh, high school students who are homeless due to no fault of their own. And he actually um, sort of answered the question, which is why I put my hand down. Um, you know, kind of just meeting students where they are. And especially when you talk about rural, I've got lots of family in eastern Oklahoma, and um, I don't know that the equipment would require hard wiring or Wi Fi or anything like that. But of course, you know, the, the further out you get, the harder it is to um, connect. But it sounds like this is probably self contained, or again, his solution of able to meet people where they are with uh, equipment that they already have, like Netflix, PlayStation, stuff like that. Um, yeah. So he kind of answered the question, actually. <laughs> but I'm glad you guys both said that, because now I have a question for you. Yeah. So let's say that maybe the, the local library of their for example, or we somehow created an avenue to be on PlayStation, and they have the headset of the PlayStation, which, you know, that'll get cheap all the time, too. Do you think it's silly to think that, obviously, you know, at that point, we're in essence giving away the content, right? Um, maybe it's too great for But what if there's an ad? That's my question to you. If there's an advertising, is that going to just ruin everything? An ad beforehand, an ad after? Okay. And you're in YouTube. People watch YouTube all day long with ads on there. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You don't think it would take away from the, I don't from think so. From the, the uh, we talk true nature of the product. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much. So what if you had those ads be for employers? That would oh, yeah, be really yeah. Definitely, yeah. And that's something that keeps coming up a lot, too. When I first started talking to people about this idea, they keep saying, you know, what well, the employers, the employers, and other words, you know, you should, your, your customers should be your the employer, the employers need this, the employers need this. And kind of the, the, the downside to that is that very soon, content creators like myself will be somewhat a dime a dozen, like right now, it's easy to find somebody who will do a, 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 a streaming video for you, right? What we call flat e, flat, regular 2D framed video, not, not, a, not virtual, not virtual. But at some point it's gonna get so ubiquitous that maybe it'll all be done in house. But, and so I, I kind of didn't want to go that route at first until I talked to Ken Parker. I'm not sure most people in this room know Ken Parker is here. And I just met him recently, Ken Parker says, don't be afraid of that. Yeah, yeah, VR is the Wild West right now. It's anybody's game, per se. Um, make as much noise as you can doing that. And then pivot at some point, innovate later when you need to. Um, you know, so I was trying to think 10 years ahead. But you know, just make some money for 10 years and then pivot later. I'm wondering for organizations and businesses that would be interested in partnering with you to create the content. Can you talk through that process a little bit? I, I'm imagining it takes a lot of collaboration <coughs> storyboarding and exactly what you're going to put together in the content? Yeah, so it kind of depends on um, what they're trying to accomplish with the content. So, <coughs> as it stands right now, when they have college grads just, just finished under, just, just finished um, undergraduate, bachelor's degree, they come, they work for, for the Thunder, 
and the Thunder trains them in their sales techniques and policies and whatnot. And this is what they do right now. They're doing sales training this summer. And they put that young man that one went down, they sent down a bunch here, and they, the, training, the trainer sits in the other chair. He says, okay, we're going to do a little role play. Imagine you're in an office. They say this now, right? They, pretend you're in an office. Pretend I'm your prospect, your potential client. You're going to pitch to me. What would you say to me on your market set go? Right, so they do that now. So they wanted to modernize that, right? So in that scenario, it's very much scripted to talk about you talk about the workflow. So we then we have a script that we created. We have the right way to sell and the wrong way to sell. Um, and basically, if you're just trying to just start working with Thunder, what you're going to experience is they're going to say, okay, put on this headset and watch this video. And you're watching a very like one minute clip on how not to sell. Um, and you, you hear the person get these mistakes. So then we take off the headset, we debrief, and we say, okay, what do you think they did wrong in that scenario? The, the, the salesperson, uh, what would you have done differently? Did you notice anything in the room that helped you build rapport with this client? Because what we wanted them to say is that they didn't build any rapport, they went straight to the sale, and it was a very flat conversation. So what would you have done differently is the question. And what did you see in the room that would have helped you? So for this particular person that we're creating, it's supposed to be an, an affluent uh, customer, right? Um, because we're in this very nice office, virtually created a virtual office. We're in this very nice office and we see a picture of a Ferrari on the wall. There's sailing memorabilia all throughout the office, pictures of the, the, uh, the uh, prospect's family. So it, long story short, it, that's very much scripted and storyboarded out and a lot of thought into it. Then you've got the, you know, just the natural, organic flow of the day, um, or of a, of a particular scenario, just like you would be training today. So you would be shouting on a person training and you say, okay, here's what we do. When the customer comes in, you've got to say this, you've got to do that. Never touch this. And you see this over here, make sure this is always looked on. Okay, you give it a shot. Right? So if it's just video, then it's, we plop down the camera, step away, and, and they go. So that it's simple, right? <coughs> Let's say they want to make it more dynamic, right? The video game version of it. To where in the video, the advantage of the video game version is that you lift up your right hand, you lift up your left hand, and you see your own digital hand in the world, and when you reach out and touch a button, it responds and you're actually touching a button, so that's also very possible too. And that would require a lot more uh, set up, a lot more um, storyboarding, as you say, and then all the programming behind it, the 3D animation of it, which is all not impossible, but you know, just makes it more um, challenging, more expensive. Yes, sir. So, this is a question that might be of interest to the 1 million cups audience. Of the folks that come to you, the people that come to these students, uh, for advice and uh, uh, career uh, direction. Uh, how many of them are interested? How many of them tell you they want to start their own business? They want to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> that's a very, that's a very good question. So um, I worked with I worked with 75 students at Oklahoma City Community College. So I, I just I stepped out to step down to to do occupy. Um, so when I worked there for, for for three years, and then just my experience in general, it's a very small percentage of students that number one even know what it is to be an entrepreneur. That, that that's a career option. And then number two, that are uh, old enough to, or, you know, um, creative enough to, to want to take that step. Now, I will say this, so uh, there's a student who is now a senior at Westmore High School, and as soon as I announced it to, to, my, to my students that I was stepping down to, to the occupant, he runs up to me after the, uh, the workshop. He says, hey, Greg, can I be an intern with you? I want to start my own business, too. So there's definitely, it's definitely out there. Um, I, over the years, since I've been working with young people, I've probably had met 10, over the past, maybe over the past 10, 15 years, I've met 10 students in high school who know that they want to start their own business. And so when I tell them, okay, you want to start a business? Do it right now, today, start a business. And you know, I tell them a story about Mark Cuban, how when Mark Cuban was a teenager, he would sell stamps. And then once he went to college, he opened, he helped open up a, a bar. So this idea that, you know, start it now, I'm sure you've heard that narrative before too. That's one of the best ways to learn about how to start a business is if you just start one, right? Um, so yeah, it's, it's it's a lot of all I would say, but we definitely would need, would need more outreach, more awareness, because um, it's, it's in progress. So I love it, the idea of entrepreneurship. Am I right? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. 